One of Erickson's core findings is that how expert one becomes at a skill has more to do with how one practices. An expert breaks down the skills into smaller chunks and pairs those skills with immediate coaching feedback. Today, Jesse will speak with us about the opportunity we have to help one another with deliberate practice. His, the title of his speech today is The Breakfast of Champions, and his speech is Evaluate to Motivate from the Successful Club Series, and his time is 12 to 15 minutes. Welcome, Jesse. the opportunity to do as Toastmasters is to offer evaluations. Now, if I'm being 100% honest with you, evaluations are my least favorite part of the meeting. Not because I don't like receiving them, but because I'm terrible at giving them. Now, I'm fairly certain I've heard Raylene say evaluations are your favorite part of the meeting. Is that right? See, we have someone who loves evaluations right here. Today I'd like to share with you a few ideas about evaluations and how we can all be better as we evaluate one another in our speeches. I'd like to start with a couple of brief examples. The first one goes way back to these days. Hi, welcome to Wendy's. Can I take your order? Hi, welcome to Wendy's. Can I take your order? Would you like cheese on that? Would you like fries with your burger? Would you like to biggie size it? That was how I spent four years of my life. <laughs> Starting at the end of my freshman year of high school, I worked at Wendy's. For the most part, it was a great experience. I had nice people that I worked with. It was a great first job, a great opportunity to learn a lot of things, and they took a chance on hiring a 15-year-old. The one thing that I hated the most about working at Wendy's was one of the managers whose name was Clint. Clint could be a really nice guy, but he also had a very short fuse. And it wasn't even when Clint got upset that he would scream or yell or kick people. Not kidding, he kicked people. It's that once he got upset, he stayed upset. If something upset Clint at 8 a.m. in the morning, he was still upset at 5 p.m. The worst thing that you could do then, during that shift, is to mess up and do something wrong. And then you get that feedback from Clint where it's all yelling and shouting and you're stupid and can't you do anything right? And that can be pretty hard when you're 16 years old, trying to run a cash register, trying to count back change, trying to keep everybody happy. Now let me move ahead of a few years. Attending a junior college to earn money, I had the opportunity to work at a video store when those were still around and existed. Anybody remember those video stores, a couple of people? It's like Redbox, but there's people inside. <laughs> and I loved working at the video store way better than working fast food. Everybody was older, it was much more mature, there was great interaction with the customers. But one of the best things was the owner of this video store, his name was Eric. And Eric had a way that he could come up to you and say, you suck, <laughs> and you can do better. And after that conversation, you would say, he's right, I do suck, and I can do better. I think part of that was Eric was very sincere, he was honest, he was clear about what needed to happen, and he didn't yell or shout about it. We'll come back to Clinton Eric later on. Let's talk about this right now. Who's been watching the Olympics? A couple of people. What, what's your favorite Olympic sport, Carolyn? Uh, gymnastics. Gymnastics. Over here, is it Steven? What's your favorite Olympic sport? Beach volleyball. Beach volleyball, right here. I'm sorry, I enjoy watching handball right now. It's 
totally weird. Man, Falk is so weird. That is the same reason that curling is my favorite winter sport. I, I just watch it for sheer entertainment. Let's watch these guys yell at each other as they work the brooms down, down the thing, right? It's fantastic. Has anybody been watching this sport? Who, who knows who that is? Yeah, it's Michael Phelps, right? I gave you an obvious one here in case you didn't recognize him in the water. Who can tell me something interesting about Michael Phelps? Go ahead. Well, there was a, just not too long ago, a period of time in his life where he just wanted to give up on everything and had a second DUI and went to a facility in Phoenix. And he said to swim, there was a pool at this place, and it just took him two, two movements of his arms and he was at the other end of the pool. Okay. And uh, so he had to figure out how he could reach that pool to benefit his... Because they're so small, right? They're so small, right? Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. He's won more, I believe he's won more gold medals than any other human in history. Yes, 22 right now. Olympic, gold Olympic medals. Yep. I heard the other day he's won more medals than like 130 countries. Yeah. But that's, yeah. that's probably true. So as I was doing some research for this, I found that his 22 gold medals is actually twice as many as the second place person for gold medals. Now, Michael Phelps, he got it easy because this guy is built to swim. Did you know that? He's, he's, he's six feet, four inches tall. He has a long, narrow torso and short legs. These two things combined create very little drag and it makes him kind of like a hydrofoil across the water. Now as Carolyn mentioned, his arm span is actually six feet, seven inches. So the guy's kind of like a gorilla, right? He has big hands, so he has these huge paddles that pull him through the water. What about his feet? Anybody know about Michael Phelps' feet? His ankles? He has a double, joint, double jointedness in his feet that allows his ankle to be completely straight so he moves through the water like a dolphin. And with a size 14 foot, that's a pretty big flipper pushing you through the water. So Michael Phelps, this guy is just built to swim, right? Can't fail. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? His coach. It's his coach. This is Bob Bowman. It's the coach of Michael Phelps. Now I'm thinking to myself, Bob Bowman must have the easiest job in the world because he coaches Michael Phelps, right? Hey, get in the water, beat everybody, and pay me money. Michael Phelps has had Bob Bowman as a coach since he was 11 years old. And he said that Bob Bowman trains like a drill sergeant. What I'm trying to get at is that even somebody who is built to be in the water, like Michael Phelps, requires someone like Bob Bowman that can work with him to make him better. Do you think that when Michael Phelps swims, he gets done with the race, do you think Bob comes over and says, hey, great job, you were so perfect, and you're perfect every time? Probably not. Now racing, I'm sure he wins the race and hey, high five, but in practice, I'm sure it's a different story. Where he's saying, hey Michael, you need to stretch out more. You need to move your arms like this. I don't know swimming terms because I swim like a bowling ball. <laughs> but I'm sure that in practice, it's very rigorous. Now this is from the Toastmasters Successful Club Series. These are points from that manual. And we're going to apply these both to Michael Phelps as well as to ourselves. So when we get feedback, again, think of Phelps racing or practicing, he gets that immediate feedback from his coach. And we have that same benefit at Toastmasters. As soon as we finish speaking, we have somebody there ready to give us an evaluation while everything is still fresh in our mind. I'm sure that Bowman is always offering methods for improvement. I doubt that his job is continuously, hey, great job, do it again, get back in the water, keep going. I even found that when Bowman was hired as the Michigan State swimming coach, Phelps followed him there. He wanted to continue on with him as his coach, and they eventually both ended up in Boston. 
finally, to build and maintain self-esteem. As you get better, you continue to see success. Now, I want to stop a little bit on this point right here because I think this is one thing that we fall a little short in in Toastmasters. It's very specific in the manual that the increase of self-esteem comes from getting better at speeches, not from telling people how great they did in their speech. Does that make sense? Here's part of my problem. This is an evaluation in one of the Toastmasters manuals. There are 10 questions here, and only one of these questions says, what could the speaker have done better? This is one of the things that I would like to challenge us as a club to become better at, is being able to offer more of what can be done better. Here's some tips for effective evaluations. There's three parts to this. Number one is before the speech. If we can, I know that timing's short sometimes, but we should communicate with the person who will be doing the evaluation. Let them know what are some of the expectations that we hope to get out of that. Second is during the speech. The evaluator listens during the speech, takes notes. We have the evaluation guides and the manuals. And then finally afterward is the evaluation, which Roscoe is gonna give me a very stellar one today. <laughs> Here are some phrases to avoid. You didn't, you should have, and you failed to. Why, why do you think these phrases don't work? Why are these phrases that should be avoided? Because they're negative, that's true. What else, Patrick, you were kind of laughing at them? I like that you failed to. You failed to? Um, who needs that? No, I'm just kidding. I just think that, I mean, who's, you know, I mean, the evaluator's not God. They don't, they're not perfect. They don't know everything about speaking. We're all just helping each other. And so if you make it kind of like this kind of relationship instead of uh, this kind of relationship, yeah. you know, we're equals, we're helping each other. I don't know a lot of things, but here's what I think. I think it's a lot more helpful than you suck. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these are, these are as Raylene said, they're very negative. They're absolutes. It's kind of showing superiority. Go ahead, Karen. I was going to say, just that was that person's opinion. Because who's to say in your speech that whatever it was that you didn't do shouldn't have been done, right? That's completely true. I had went out to lunch with one of our fellow Toastmasters, who's not here today, and he mentioned to me, hey, I love this speech that you gave, and you should have done this. But it was something that was so far out of my reach of imagination that I would have thought of for that speech. I said, well, that's great. I, I appreciate your thoughts. But it's certainly not anything that it has to be like this. Here are some things to stimulate improvement, because these are opinions, right? I believe my reaction was, or I suggest that, and on and on and on. These, and we're, I think we're pretty good in this club about, we often say, Roscoe will evaluate Jesse's speech. He's evaluating the speech, he's not evaluating, evaluating me as a person. So, yeah, he's a little iffy back there. Even if Roscoe says your speech sucked, He's not saying, Jesse, you suck, and that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a tricky question. What sometimes prevents us from giving sincere, clear, and honest feedback? Now, I'm looking to you guys that have been around a little longer because I know that I have done this, and if I'm the only one, then I'm probably going to help. <laughs> But have you ever given an evaluation to someone and you didn't give them all of the points that you felt like they could improve on? Does that happen? Kevin's kind of thinking well, I about think it. if you did it in private, you get 10 times okay. feedback. Okay, 10 times. Or else we get a one. comment as well? Yeah, there's, there's two on that. Part of it is timing, right? You just gave a seven minute speech or a 12 minute speech and you're condensing it down to two and a half to three minutes and, and trying to hit on the highlights. And the second one is you talked about, it's to build self-esteem. There's some things that somebody at a higher level can take and actually start to 
implement and improve upon. Or if you stood up there and talked about everything, would you start to tear down self-esteem? At least I believe you would tear down self-esteem. So I, I'm it's with not you. you didn't no, and that's exactly where I'm going, is that you, you get I it. hold back because I believe you can't handle it. Now, the difference is, though, is when you talk to them after, and, and you've had my evaluations before mm -hmm. the way I do them, versus traditional, I have a notes page that I took all these notes on. It just has smiley faces or frowning faces. And I said, if you want to get with me for more or additional, I'd be happy to explain these to you. Because I have a lot more to give than, than time permits for one. But for two, sometimes it's better off for you to take home and digest. Because I've been there. I've given that speech that I felt horrible about. You stand up and say all this positive stuff, and I'm going, eh, still, but I'm not ready to hear more bad. Right? Yeah, so it, it's, it's it, situation. No, I, I appreciate that. Joe just gave me the red light, so we're going to speed this up a little. Um, so this is what I call the 10%. This actually came from a colleague of mine. His name is Stacy Nelson. He talks about the 10%. And when we give feedback, very often, we will withhold the worst 10% because we don't think people can take that. And again, if we are communicating prior to the presentation, then we can get a feel for that person. Or as you mentioned, even speaking together after the close. Maybe we don't want to give that harshest feedback in front of everyone, but we can offer that later on. So here's your challenge, should you choose to accept it. Two challenges. Number one, be willing to give that 10%. That is where people will improve. None of us will ever get better at what we are doing if people are not telling us what we can do better. The second challenge is to be willing to receive that 10%. And that can be hard sometimes. As Roscoe mentioned, sometimes you gotta go sit at home and stew about it. And maybe sometimes that 10% needs to come outside of the meeting, but I believe it should still be given, and that would help us to give better evaluations. So those are the two challenges. Give the 10% and be willing to take the 10%. Because as we can get better at giving and receiving evaluations, that will 